to another episode of the Afterlife Chronicles and Beyond on the WLTKDB network. That's WLTKDB.com. You can also get to the site by visiting the Let's Talk.com as well. There's a chat room right there on the main website. You can sign in there. You can even sign in there uh, via Facebook too, which is a great function. I always say that at the beginning of the shows. But anyways, happy April Fool's Day. My goodness, it's already April 1st. Hello, time's flying. So anyways, um, today's a little bit of a different uh, format. I actually have my mom, Norma Strickland, on with me. And if you remember, she was actually my very first guest on the very first episode of the show back in October. I think it was October 8th, to be exact, of 2020. But so actually her and I are uh, taking the helm, so to speak, tonight, and we're going to have a little discussion on children in the paranormal. So this is actually based off of one of my presentation topics that I offer. I offer several different ones, and I believe I did this one or offered this one at the Oregon Ghost Conference. I think it was back in, oh my goodness, 2017, I believe. Uh, So it's an interesting presentation, and there's a lot to get through. Uh, So we're going to get started with that in a minute. But I wanted to, again, introduce my mom, uh, thank my mom for coming back on the show. How are you doing tonight, Mom? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me, Nicole. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can't believe, you know, October, and now it's already like April. It's crazy. But anyways... So my mom and I both have a background working with kids, and I'll let her uh, share a little bit about what she does in a second. But uh, I actually got my master's, it's a master's of science in educational counseling, and then I obtained uh, what's called a pupil personnel services credential, uh, which is what is needed to uh, be a school counselor in the state of California. So it's a PPS credential that serves kindergarten through through 12th grade. And so I have experience being a school counselor as well as being an educator with uh, San Diego Unified School District. And my mom's actually a school nurse with the district and she's been there or been a a nurse with the district for many years. So I'm going to let her share a little bit about what she does and, 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 and the work she does with kids. So go ahead, mom. Okay. So I've been with the school district for 30 years and the past 12 to 30, well, actually the past about 18 years, I've been with early childhood. So those are the three and four-year-olds. In the past 12 years, I've been with um, the three and four-year-olds on uh, early childhood special education assessment team. So those are the children that parents want them or they've been recommended by, referred by their, uh, their doctors just to have them go through an assessment process just to see if they might qualify for some special education in the school district. Fantastic. And you've been, I mean, what is it now, 30 years now with the district? This is my 30th year with the district. and I'm gonna That's amazing. Started. That is so amazing, Mom. I am so proud of you. I'm so anyways, so- yeah, go. Oh, I'm sorry. What did you say? I, I cut you off. Gonna, I'm going to keep on going, too. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so admirable. I'm so proud of you, Mom. But anyways, I, I wanted to bring her on just because of her uh, her experience with, with children. And, and this presentation uh, discusses a lot of different aspects related to children and the paranormal. I mean, as we know, kids are inherently intuitive. 
right? I mean, they they lack that ego. And so they're more in touch with their feelings and their intuition. And so we have to also remember in the paranormal field, as with any field, you know, the kids now, this is our future generation. So uh, I feel like this presentation, or there's not I, I, it is a presentation, but it kind of segueing into radio, the show is kind of important. And if we don't get through it, we can always have a part two. But again, like I said, there's a lot of information packed into this, but I wanted to start off a little bit with Eric Erickson and Jean uh, Piaget. And they are both uh, developmental psychologists. Actually, Eric Erickson was a, a German-American developmental psychologist and psychoanalyst. And he'd actually developed these stages of psychosocial development. There are eight of them. And then Jean Piaget uh, uh, concentrated more on cognitive development. And he developed the stages of cognitive development. And so although these aren't you know, necessarily inclined for paranormal, uh, you know, reasonings, of course, I think, you know, as with anything, whether, whether a child wants to become an artist or a teacher or a doctor or uh, a grocery store worker, whatever the profession, you know, as they move through these stages of development, if they don't do so correctly, I don't know if correctly is the right word, but if they, if they lack in any one of these stages, it could affect their growth in the next stage and so on, and even in life. So I just kind of wanted to go through these a little bit. So, and explore how children at each st- at each stage of development perceive, understand, and react to the paranormal uh, differently. Um, and one question that comes to mind, and this is more of like a rhetorical sort of question, just open-ended, uh, those that are listening kind of think about this, And um, I'm kind of like disjointed here, sorry. Later on, before I, I'll back up a little bit. Later on, we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, uh, you know, signs of kids being psychic and and intuitive and uh, getting into, you know, the the indigo and the rainbow children and all that. And that's that's coming later on. But uh, with that in mind, and again, this is more of a rhetorical sort of question, uh, open-ended to allow you to think about it. Uh, can psychosocial development issues actually be a sign of a gift rather than a disorder? Because a lot of times kids with ADHD and, uh, you know, uh, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, for example, are, are really in, very intuitive and, and, and psychically inclined. And in many ways, the educational system likes to uh, dampen that. So, I mean, we'll get into that in a little bit. But I briefly, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I want to go through uh, Piaget's four stages here of, of cognitive development. So the first is the sensory motor stage, and that's usually from zero to two years old. So infants focus on what is immediately in front of them and what they are visually seeing and interacting with. Now, object permanence develops between seven and nine months. And so what that is, is that babies are able to know that when an object is taken away from them, they still know that it exists. So it's a sign of memory development. So if infants experience a psychical or spiritual phenomena, the experiences can be stored in their memory banks, affecting how they perceive the concept at later stages of development. So each stage kind of builds on the ladder and, and so forth. The next one, pre-operational stage, uh, that's toddler through uh, seven years. Uh, further development of language, memory, and imagination. Imagination is a big one. They can't yet differentiate between cause and effect. So children in this phase will perceive fantasy as real, thus their perception of any paranormal-related events are real in their minds. So uh, this is kind of the phase when, you know, the imaginary friends and and imaginary thinking uh, takes place. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when this happened to me, and I've shared this on shows where when I was, I think, about five years old, I I communicated with uh, a a ghost and earthbound from the old West. And I'm sure my parent, I'm sure mommy probably thought, oh, she's just, you know, just she has an imaginary friend and that's who she's playing with. But sometimes it can be hard to distinguish what would you say i was going to say that's absolutely right and i wish that i had all this knowledge that there is available now that you share and that's in the world now i wish i had had it then 
I would have been more understanding of it. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, so many more people now are open to to um, intuition and, and param- the whole paranormal universe has kind of opened up people's minds to um, the role of intuition and, and, you know, communication with spirits and that sort of thing. So moving on, um, so in this pre-operational stage, uh, thinking is based on intuition. So children in this stage may not be able to logically explain their supernatural experiences, but yet they may still have them. So if you were at a home, for example, and always, always, if you're doing a case involving kids, you always get parental permission to interview a child, always. With that parental permission for a, a child that's, you know, maybe five or six or seven, you might want them to draw a picture. Something like that might work. But moving on, concrete operational stages from about seven to 11 years. So the development of concrete logical thinking with the ability to distinguish between reality and fantasy. Okay, so that's the main difference here. Children can initiate understanding of paranormal phenomena due to the ability to distinguish between cause and effect. Uh, they have under, uh, they understand their external environment and they can comprehend that one's own thoughts and feelings may be different than others. Uh, children can start to examine their past paranormal. If they are having paranormal accounts, they can start to examine their past paranormal accounts from a cause and effect standpoint. So this is the age probably when educating children on paranormal research should happen. Maybe not research, but if they're psychically inclined, kind of fostering their development. Okay. And then uh, I briefly wanted to address, uh, you know, the the, uh, psychokinesis a little bit uh, and uh, uh, basically what, you know, in poltergeist type of activity uh, sometimes can happen in this stage. And of course, you know, more pre-pubescent, I would say uh, to pubescent uh, age is when a lot of times you'll, let's say a household might have uh, uh, psychokinetic sorts of effects, uh, poltergeist sort of effects. And sometimes I think in, in rare cases, it can actually stem from a paranormal sort of origin, but most likely it's due to the, you know, the development of that individual and his or her emotions during uh, pre-puberty and puberty. That's the theory. And so there was actually one famous case on this. Well, Henry Holt actually in 1914 on his book, uh, or in his book on the cosmic relations really talks about psychokinesis. There was actually a famous case. There's been several famous cases, but one of which is, I think her name is Angelique Cotton. And she was known as the electric girl from France who could uh, generate psychokinetic effects, like moving scissors across a room. And it was later revealed that there was fraud involved. So um, I just briefly wanted to mention psychokinesis during these sorts of this stage and even the next stage as well when we move into the formal operational stage. That's uh, when, when children are developing, the, the, like I said, the prepubescent to pubescent sort of years when this can happen. So the formal operational stage is 11 years plus, and so children at this stage can start to think abstractly and form hypotheses. They can examine their environment in hypothetical ways. Uh, In regards to the paranormal, children in this stage can postulate new theories and attempt to test existing ones, right? They can initiate their own individual studies of the paranormal realm with the ability to understand various concepts. All right, so quickly moving now into um, Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. There are eight of them. I'm going to go through these really quick. Trust versus mistrust is from... Uh, birth to 1.5 years and there's a virtue assigned to each of these so the virtue for this this one is hope so babies have to have trust at this stage when a crisis ensues he or she will receive support so it's all about building trust with with parents and, and the adults around around them so if babies at this stage do not receive the trust that they are yearning, yearning they will learn to mistrust others in their environment resulting in self-concept and self-esteem issues down the road Uh, Autonomy versus shame and doubt is from 1.5 years to three years, and the virtue here is will. So children start using their individual skills and ability, and so they start getting that sense of autonomy and independence. If they are encouraged to develop these traits, they will become more confident and secure in contributing to society as as older children and adults. And like I said earlier, this doesn't just apply to the paranormal. I mean, hello, duh, right? This applies to... Any sort of 
um, future, any sort of, uh, uh, whether it's, it's a car- career choice, family dynamics, uh, relationships, as, as children uh, develop and grow, they're going to want to make sure that they move through these stages adequate, adequately, right? So they can become the person that they're meant to be as adults, okay? So moving on, initiative versus guilt is from three to five years. The virtue associated with this is a purpose. So exploration of interpersonal skills. If children are supported in their attempts to lead and make decisions, they will be more confident to do so as an adult. So if, if an adult does not support a child's initiative during these years, the child may feel a sense of guilt and showcase a lack of initiative as adults. So that's essentially what this is. Industry versus inferiority is from five to 12 years. Uh, virtue is competency. So children at this stage feel a sense of pride in their accomplishments. Uh, they want to uh, win approval by showcasing certain uh, um, competencies valued by society. So if they're not supported in this, then as adults, they may lack the confidence to achieve goals and doubt their abilities and not reach their potential. Identity versus role confusion is 12 to 18 years, and the virtue here is fidelity. So this is uh, segueing into the adolescent stage of development here. A sense of self. So uh, in this stage, uh, developing a sense of self, personal beliefs, values, goals. The learning of the roles he or she will be as an adult and committing oneself to others and accepting others for their own individual beliefs and opinions. So without any sort of exploration in this sort of uh, uh, stage, a child will develop role confusion, not knowing how to necessarily fit in with society. Intimacy versus isolation is from 18 to 40 years with the virtue of love. Children want to have a sense of commitment. They want to have a sense of care. They want to have a sense of happiness in in all their relationships. And so avoiding this can lead to despair, isolation, depression, and so on. And then you have generativity versus stagnation from 40 to 65 years. The virtue here is care. Developing, so in this stage, you want to develop your sense of self and see the bigger picture and where you fit in with the bigger picture, career, family, etc., and giving back by contributing to society. So by failing to do this, people can feel stagnant and unproductive is essentially what this is. And then the last one is ego integrity versus despair. And this is 65 years and uh, and onward. And the virtue virtue here is wisdom. So in this stage, uh, you're recollecting, uh, or there's a recollection of your accomplishments and contributions to society. So if people do not really feel like they've really contributed to society or they've not, they feel like as though they've, they haven't led a successful life, they can feel despair and hopelessness. So the goal is to have a sense of closure and completeness and accepting death without fear. So paranormal wise, if you're in this and, you know, if you're properly moving through this stage, you're going to be able to, to come to terms, I guess, with your own mortality a little bit. Um, So these stages, like I said, they apply to all children, to all developmental, you know, to anyone who's developing. um, And again, moving through them properly can help people become the best person that they can be, right? So uh, I'm actually, we're going to actually take a break because moving uh, onward after that, we're going to get into some signs that children communicate uh, with the beyond, if you will, whether it's ghosts or spirits, other energies, and and a little bit of a discussion and uh, uh, paranormal cases involving kids and a little bit more of what to look for. So uh, stay tuned, and we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come back in about two minutes. You are listening to the Afterlife Chronicles and Beyond. I'm your host, Nicole Strickland, and we will be back shortly. stations in the world we're one of them we are controlling transmission wltk db let's talk alternative talk radio wltkdb.com 
Ever wanted to host your own radio show? If your answer is yes, then the time to act is now. WLTK DB Let's Talk is now accepting new programming more affordable than ever. You create the show idea and we'll take care of the rest. Not only do we create your program intro and provide broadcast training, but also syndicate you to popular outlets like Apple and Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and more. You get all of this starting at 100 bucks per month. Three packages to choose from and built to make your wallet happy. Contact us at WLTKDB.com with your show idea and let's bring your dream to life. All topics accepted and you have full rights to your program. Contact us today and reserve your spot on WLTKDB Let's Talk. What are you waiting for? Let's do this. minutes past the hour you are tuning in to the afterlife chronicles and beyond i am your host nicole strickland on the wltk db network that's wltkdb.com you can also get to the main site again by visiting the let's talk.com right there if you haven't already feel free to join the chat room right there on the main website so to, uh, tonight joining me is my lovely mom norma strickland mom thank you so much for joining me tonight are you still there? Yeah, no? I'm here. Okay. So <laughs> I'm like, maybe she is. I'm like, maybe not. <laughs> That's okay. No worries. So, um, so we were talking a little bit about, you know, the, before the break, uh, just kind of a rundown of, of uh, Jean Piaget and Eric Erickson's uh, stages of uh, Psychosocial development and cognitive development there. I know that was kind of uh, dry and maybe boring, but it's, you know, it's applicable to, to uh, develop mental stages and, and to, you know, as we adult and, and get older and all of that. So before uh, I go any further, I do want to give a shout out to Len in chat. Hello, Len. Hope you're doing well this evening. So uh, segueing a little bit into uh, discussing uh, some of the signs that children communicate with ghost spirits and those, uh, you know, and, and even other en- energies out there. These are some that I have jotted. And of course, mom, if you can think of others, um, chime in, of course. You know, so, Nicole, Nicole, there is something I real quickly I would like to say if that's all. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. Go for when, it. When you just mentioned that there was a lot of stages and a lot of detailed information. You know, I think just from an older, a very older person here that I am, just looking back on my experience as a mother and the, the most important thing for children in general is, you know, not, not necessarily so much of them having to worry about those particular stages, but providing them with a loving and safe environment. And then most importantly, listening to their children, listen to them, because I think as parents, at least many years ago, we just kind of like dictated and, you know, and and it tried to fit children into society and children are little people and they have a, a mind of their own. And it's important to develop those minds and allow those minds to take their course. So that's all I wanted to share. So if anybody thought, oh, that's all detail, really, it's all a matter about loving providing a safe environment, listening and allowing. That's beautifully said. My goodness. Thank you so much, mom. I mean, it's, it's so true. I mean, love goes, I think love is kind of the foundation. I think love can help us in, in, in so many, so many different ways. So, um, you know, children are a little bit more aware of their feelings and their intuition. Maybe they don't know it, but they, but they, they, they know it subconsciously, I guess. They're in touch with it more so than adults. It's a similar situation with, with animals. So not to say that, let's say your, your, your child is exhibiting one or more of these signs doesn't mean necessarily that they are communicating with the beyond or, or with ghosts or spirits or any you know, other energies, but it could be a sign. So it's one of those things, if if you're a parent and you see these signs, you want to take note, maybe, you know, keep a log, uh, keep, you know, uh, observe your child and to see if there's any other patterns that develop. So some of the signs that I've jotted down, of course, are withdrawal from family and peers. 
So, and again, not by itself. I mean, there are many kids that may withdraw, withdraw from family and friends for other reasons. And it doesn't mean that, oh, just because you withdraw from your family and friends, that that means you're experiencing something paranormal. No, no, there's other reasons for it. But it could indicate that maybe uh, a, a child or a teenager is, is uh, you know, having some sort of paranormal experiences. Uh, changes in academics and activities could be another sign. Uh, sleep disturbances, uh, lucid dreaming, of course. You know, I'm one of those that, that dreams a lot. I'm, I'm very much a lucid dreamer. And some people are just a little bit more naturally inclined to that. But, I mean, if a study was done on people that, you know, remember their dreams and have lucid dreams, I wonder what the percentage would be of those that are extremely psychically inclined. I would, I would think it would be uh, high, I would think. So sleep disturbances, this can, can, could include nightmares. This can maybe include not wanting to sleep in a certain room, uh, maybe at the child's room, no more, uh, something like that. Uh, preoccupation, spending time alone. And again, there's numer- numerous other reasons for this, but it could be an indicator. Uh, some sort of sudden uh, change of routine. Uh, you know, if you notice that your child isn't really, it was maybe very routinely inclined and all of a sudden just wants to, to maybe uh, change his or her routine, uh, I would pay attention to that. Obviously, more of the obvious uh, signs indicating more that there might be some sort of paranormal origin would be sudden fear of a location. This could be the child's bedroom. This could be going to visit grandma. No, 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 I don't want to go in grandma's house anymore. Something like that. Um, Talking with unseen forces. Now, in the case, like I mentioned earlier with myself, when I was about five, I sat in my bedroom and, of course, in the living room, and I did have a communication with an earthbound. But at the time, I'm sure my parents didn't know that. And they thought, oh, well, she's at the age you know, of, of, of having imaginary friends. That's what that is. And that could be. Absolutely. But it could also be that maybe your child is communicating with, with, you know, an unseen entity, spirit, or found. This is a big one. Recalling information from deceased relatives or friends. So if like, let's say a, let's say grandpa passes away, or maybe um, a better example would be maybe great grandpa that the child didn't know, obviously, but, you know, that child's able to recall what great grandpa looked like, uh, what he, what he did, uh, things like that, you know, and obviously this would be information that was never provided to the child. So being able to recall that sort of information, that's, that's kind of a big one right there. Uh, and then of course, you know, having an interest in, in studying the paranormal. And this is obviously as, as they grow older, uh, this I can speak personally for myself. I mean, my interest started, I mean, back when I was, you know, in elementary school and moving on into middle school and high school. Uh, so having that interest in, in studying the paranormal. And then, of course, a child that has extreme perception and sensitivity. So, you know, more so than than I guess the average. So extreme perception and sensitivity. And then, of course, showcases signs of... Uh, you know, psychically inclined behavior. So those are those are some ones that I've listed that stand out. Mom, do you have others that? Because I know there are others I that I didn't list. But any of anything else you want to add to that or chime in on? I I would just say that I, I'm thinking of some children as they get a little bit older might really become introverted. You know, just draw in because they're, maybe their families are thinking just like you said. That, that, um, that that's an imaginary friend and maybe they're thinking, what how are we going to take care of this? Maybe it extends into little older years and they're worried about that. And so they start with maybe psychotherapy and all of that. And, and so it can make a child feel, I think, feel wrong about their own makeup, about their own existence. So that's right. really important, important to, um, to remember, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, as paranormal investigators, you know, we're often called to homes, you know, that, uh, you know, that involve children. It might be a case where the entire family is experiencing paranormal activity, or it could be a case that centers around a child. And those are very, very uh, important cases. And so 
you know, these are some things that if you are going on a paranormal case study involving children, again, it may not be centering on the child, but it involves a child somehow. These are some things, you know, that I and, and, you know, the San Diego Paranormal Research Society look at when we're on such a case. So we kind of ask ourselves, is the child now speaking of the child's experiences and what he or she is relaying? Is that experience or experiences innate or learned? What I mean by that is, is the child having an experience that all on his own without being influenced by other adults or siblings in the household? There have been cases where we've gone on where, you know, mom and dad have these experiences where the child hears mom and dad talking about it. And then yet the child then starts to have those experiences. So uh, important to kind of differentiate between that. And is the ex- oh, go ahead. I was just going to mention too, with all the uh, shows on TV now, and I'm not going to, you know, one way or the other for or against, but with those shows and the TVs are on and parents are watching that and the children can see that too, all of that can influence the child too. Absolutely. Suggestibility, bias, all of that. So yes. it's kind of, it's good to differentiate. You know, and and kind of get your eye on whether it's an innate experience or something that was learned. Uh, Are the experiences stemming from the child's personal environment? Okay, so one example I have here is maybe uh, video games, maybe. Maybe the child, and we had a case like this where the child, uh, and I keep saying, I mean, mean, take a shot every time I say child. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) How many times do I say that word? Anyways, um, so... We had a we had a case where it was oh I want to say it was a an an eleven or twelve year old uh, boy who was playing video games late at night late at night before bed and then all of a sudden started having uh, these experiences at night and only at night in the middle of the night so to speak and at all hours of the night and so uh, nightmares. Uh, Um, emotions of being afraid of the dark, that sort of thing. And so we talked with the parents of, uh, you know, not having him play video games way late at night, maybe earlier in the day. And sure enough, after that, that routine changed and he didn't, you know, play video games late at night, those experiences kind of ceased. So that's an example of that. Uh, And then also is the experience caused from the child's external environment. So again, you mentioned uh, the TV shows, for example, I guess that could be an example of, I mean, I guess you could argue, no, it's uh, your personal environment yet, but yet it's an external environment, but maybe peers, you know, at school uh, is he or she being influenced by uh, friends uh, at school, for example, Um, that's something to pay attention to as well. Uh, let's see. Another thing we look at too, if like in if it's a private residence, of course. Let's say you have a family of four. I'm just giving a, a hypothetical example here. You have a family of four. You have mom, dad, an older sister, and a younger brother. And so, mom and dad are having experiences, and then uh, the older sister is, but not the brother. So the older sister uh, has different sorts of reports and experiences that that uh, obviously differ from her parents. So that's something to look at uh, versus are, is every single person in the family having the exact same sort of encounter at the exact same time, that sort of thing. Then you have to go back to the previous steps of, okay, are they hearing each other? Are they, are they kind of suggesting to each other? Are they talking about it and influencing each other? So these are kind of like all things you have to look at. Um, and then of course, you know, being backed up by other witnesses can help in the sense that, you know, the more witnesses you have that are, are are genuine encounters and not influenced by something else, that kind of lends more credibility to the actual paranormal encounter being something genuine in nature, genuine paranormal encounter in nature. And then, of course, are there any biological factors causing the child's experience? You know, you need to look at medication. Certain medications can, emotional disturbance, puberty, things like that, uh, sleep disorders. 
uh, whether it's, uh, gosh, night terrors or sleepwalking, anything like that. Night terrors is an interesting thing because we get, we get a lot of requests, and I, I'm sure many other teams do as well about this, where people, adults and children, will report having what literally, based on the description, matches a night terror type of episode. Now, in rare cases, there may be a paranormal origin with those sorts of, uh, with that type of sleep disturbance, but mostly it's, it's a biological phenomenon. It's just, you know, it has to do with interrupted REM and non-REM stages of sleep, and that can cause you to have uh, certain emotions like fear, uh, being like you're, you're uh, stuck in bed, unable to move. You may see uh, shadow figures. You may see, you may hallucinate and see uh, apparitional sightings. And again, there, again, you can have a sleep terror or a night terror, if you will, that can have paranormal activity connected to it. But in most cases, it's, it's a biological phenomenon. So uh, medications, emotional disturbance, puberty, sleep disorders, that sort of thing, very important to look into. And then, of course, you know, to help uh, children cope with any sort of uh, paranormal encounters that they're, they're dealing with, make sure that his or her routine isn't altered too much because, you know, children like routines. They thrive on routines, some better than others. And never, never judge, and this is what you were alluding to earlier, Mom, which is so important, yeah. never judge or ridicule a children's experience. Never. If you have a child that is now uh, starting to become more psychically inclined or aware of intuition and aware of, of paranormal encounters, you don't, you don't want to stagnate. You don't want to judge. You know, you want to have an open discussion. Yeah, I mean, it'll help. Sometimes the children will help adults understand the phenomena as well. Right. So, uh, you know, you want to have an open-ended discussion and not have any sorts of judgment involved. And then, of course, with interviews, this is a tricky situation. Like I said earlier, you always get parental permission, always. Verbal, okay, if it's filmed, if it's on, if it's on audio, you have that to document. But something written, that they're okaying you as the investigator as the researcher to interview their child. Okay. You need that parental permission. And so two things I have here, picture drawing, especially for uh, younger children may help because you're asking them to draw a picture of what they are experiencing. So you're not necessarily influencing. You're not saying, okay, well, Johnny, I think that, you know, you said you saw a shadow figure, right? So, Johnny, can you please draw a picture of a shadow figure? No, no, that's influencing. You hand them a piece of paper and you say, okay, you know, draw draw me a picture. Draw me a picture of what you're seeing, you know. And so that can be very helpful. And you don't want to to focus on uh, the why or how necessarily. Maybe with older children or those maybe in their, their early 20s, young adulthood, you want to focus on the what, when, and where, not necessarily the why and how. So those are some points I wanted to address. Um, Mom, can I'm sure you can think of others that aren't on here. Anything you want to add to that? No, but I just wish some of this valuable information could kind of seep its way into this, uh, the school system because I don't think that, right. it, it, you know, the, even younger ages, but... I, I think there's someone that you know that does uh, is involved with high school students, right? And has opened up with with that with with high school students. Isn't that correct? And they have a a group or something. At least I'm remembering that. But I know, yeah, there are certain groups that all like have classes for for kids and that sort of thing. I know actually the Oregon Ghost Conference. That's probably what you're referring to. Um, uh, Rocky Smith, I believe, and, and Aaron Collins have held a uh, like a paranormal uh, ghost investigating course for kids. Okay, and it's great. It's that's great. So things like that, I think, can be you know, especially for those that that are really showcasing an interest in the field. Uh, maybe someone you know, the age of three or four, no, 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 or five or six or seven or eight, no. But if you're getting more into like late middle school and high yeah. school, yeah. you can start to introduce them to what we do. Do you want to bring them on a case study? Not necessarily. No, they're too young for that. But you can at least start to to uh, you know foster their knowledge and foster their curiosity. So, so mentorship for children who are psychically inclined, right? So. 
Uh, and this alludes again, Mom, to what you were saying earlier. Um, you want to have parental guardian support and an understanding of the psychical abilities. You don't ever want to stagnate or, or shelter a child because he or she is is, is uh, discovering that you know he has abilities. He or she has abilities. You want to fa- help foster that, and it can be kind of a, a you can make it a fun family event, and actually, it's going to help the parents to understand too. That's right. Right. So there can be that open dialogue, open, healthy dialogue, which leads into the next point. You want to keep an open, healthy dialogue with children regarding their gifts. Journaling can help. Uh, you know, some some people like to journal more than others. But, you know, that for those that like to write, journaling can be very effective. Uh, I think that there needs to be more education um, for children on how to understand, utilize and cope with their intuitive gifts. I think uh, that can really go a long way, not just paranormal wise, but for life in general, because intuition helps guide us in so many aspects and avenues of our life. Um, So again, evolving classes about paranormal research and and developing psychic uh, senses specifically designed for kids and even families. It can be a family type of unit that that goes to these sorts of classes. So I think uh, these are just some points here. Moving on, uh, I think this is important, not just for adults, obviously, but for kids as well. I mean, my goodness, if, if I was taught how to do this better when I was younger, I would be much better at it as an adult. I mean, I'm still learning this and teaching children ways to get in touch with their feelings and their emotions, uh, teaching them, you know, about energy work and, and the chakras and how those play into the role of intuition. I think all of that that's if fostered at a young age, I mean, can help in so many ways. Uh, to, to channel, to channel it, you know, in, an, in a way that would be acceptable in, in society. Exactly, exactly. Um, educating more, and again, this kind of goes along along more in the classes, but as, as you know, you, they get older, uh, maybe more a little bit on, on the earthbound energy, spirit, spiritual communication, that sort of thing. Uh, just as with adults, uh, educate children on spiritual protection, meditation techniques, grounding and centering. That, that's going to help in all kinds of different aspects of life, not just specifically for psychical reasons. Uh, listen and gain an understanding of a child's special intuitive gifts this is kind of like all blending into one. Uh, you know, by knowing what they experience, you will be better inclined to help them foster their gifts. So this is good for the parents of the household or, or other parental guardians to have an understanding as well. Because like I said, it can, I'm kind of repeating myself, but it can keep that open, healthy dialogue. Uh, you know, support groups, uh, getting together with other kids who have similar uh, intuitive abilities and sim- similar psychical abilities. You know, this is going to lead to more awareness and acceptance. Absolutely. And they can gain more techniques for utilizing these abilities. Um, what did you say? I was going to say absolutely. And I just wish I, I would like I would like to think that society will will open up more for this. You know, that, that these would be available because it would be very lonely being a child and having this type of experience and not maybe at home it's accepted, but maybe the parents say, well, still talk about it at school, you know, they right. accept it, that type of thing. So I don't think it's branched out into society very much. The, the shows on TV are not doing a very good job of educating in that sense. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I'd have to agree. I mean, I think, yeah. And I mean, this is our future generation too. Right. Yeah. right. So, I mean, and then we're going to move into, here, um, a couple other points. I mean, having that child find a trusted mentor that can help him or her, right? Um, and you want to ne- you don't ever want to judge, like I said, or see them as different ever, because if if they're not secure in their abilities yet, and they're kind of they haven't developed that self concept and being uh, confident in their abilities, and they're experiencing people that are seeing them as different, that's going to hold them back. So you don't want to treat in children different for, you know, their their intuitive abilities. They'll grow up feeling a sense of self-contradiction, you know. They, exactly. They won't feel good. I mean, how could anybody? And then we grow them to adults, and then no wonder why so many adults, ha- ha- you know, have things going on because they didn't have this uh, this uh, openness when as a child. Right. And a lot of times, too, you know, uh, 
someone who has the ha, you know has these sorts of abilities but yet don't know about it or they don't have i guess uh, control over them that's going to manifest in you know emotional disturbance and maybe even sure. some some other psychological problems or, or physical issues so so this is a good tool, um, Nicole. This is such valuable information. Thank you for sharing it. It's just wonderful. Oh, thank you. And there's a lot here. I'm not even sure if we're going to finish, but I wanted to, and we can get into a little bit about indigo children. Uh, so, I, you know, a little bit about the traits of indigo children. And I think there are many of them and more of them now than than uh, we were previously aware of. I think just because more people are are, you know, more open to, uh, spirituality and 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 working with uh, you know spiritual beings, but Nancy and Tap actually uh, was really involved in in indigo children, and so after 1980, she actually found that 80 percent of babies were born with indigo color to to their eyes, similar to the third eye chakra, which regulates clairvoyance, which is interesting. So some of the traits of, of indigos is they're often labeled, and this is again in the school system where you may have kids that have ADD or ADHD, or maybe they're 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 diagnosed as autistic. I don't. That's a whole other discussion. I think autism is very uh, overly diagnosed, but you know the school system likes to label these as disorders. The kid has a disorder. The kid has a problem. When in fact. It's in many ways, it's the other way around. It's just a different way that they're expressing themselves. Um, so, you know, a lot of indigo kids are often labeled as aggressive, hyperactive. They have that warrior persona. So they want to, they don't really get along with rigid systems. They want to break down old systems and they want to instill honesty and integrity in the world. They may be natural leaders. They're extremely percep- perceptive. They're telepathic. They have right and left brain alignment. Uh, they have extreme psychic abilities and sensitivity, and they have wisdom beyond their ears. Think of the old soul, right? You've met kids where you're like, oh, my gosh, that kid has so many lifetimes behind him, old souls. And so, like I said, a lot of these children are, are labeled as having attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They may... Uh, be diagnosed as having autism or, or Asperger's, and they're often medicated. They're often medicated, which numbs their natural abilities. And so Nancy and Tap, I believe, is the one that re-spelled autistic, and, and she spelled it A-W-E, like, ah, yeah. A-W-E-T-I-S-T-I-C, which is, a, and she said, attention dialed into a higher dimension. Really cool. Attention dialed into a higher dimension, which is so oh, cool. Awesome. Gives me goosebumps. I know, right? So yeah. um, I'm trying to go on here. Uh, so I have a little bit of. I'm gonna, I think we're going to run on town. I run out of time here, but a little bit of the, uh, a little bit on blue ray children and crystal children. Uh, so blue rays were the forerunners of the crystal children. And so their traits, I mean, these kind of all blend together, but there are some similarities and differences. So blue rays are usually, uh, they evolve really early and they like to teach others at a very young age. They're very aware of their mission on earth and they have extreme telekinetic powers. They're determined, stubborn, and they have a love for language and travel, vivid dreaming. And they're found to have an affinity for water and drawn to animals. Crystal Children is the newer generation of the Rainbow Kids, I think, believe, in the last uh, 10 years or so, I believe. So they're typically labeled as autistic, which is, I think, is, like I said, overdiagnosed nowadays. Uh, They don't communicate with the outer world in the way that is considered the norm, but that does not mean that they do not communicate. They communicate in other ways, and we need to help foster that. Is my opinion. Yes. Um, they often have uh, some physical limitations, delayed speech patterns. They're in a world of their own. They seem to be anyways. Hypersensitive to physical environment. Known for their healing qualities, clairsentience, which is the like it being an empath, the ability to feel. They have compassion. 
and they prefer to communicate via sound, music, and sign language. Okay, so crystal children. One person I wanted to to mention, and he's famous for this, is actually Ken Peek, and he actually had savant syndrome. And so that's a rare and extraordinary condition where people that have various mental and physical disabilities display a certain level of genius in uh, other areas, which is linked to massive memory. And so approximately 10% of autistic children have this condition. So Kim Peek, if you know the movie Rain, do you remember Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise? Yes. That's what this movie was based off of. It's based off of, based off of Kim Peek. Uh, he's probably America's most famous savant. He was born with macrocephaly, which is a condition where the head is abnormally enlarged in the cerebellum with some cerebellum damage. A genesis of the corpus callosum in the brain, uh, the nerve bundle connecting the two brain hemispheres is missing, actually. So this results in extreme memory capacity, which is interesting. And he started memorizing things. And I've seen videos of this man and his ability. I mean, oh, my gosh, it's, it's amazing what he can do. And he started memorizing things at 16 months. He could memorize books. He could recall almost every detail he read just after looking at it like one time. Phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so memorizing vast amounts of information relating to history, literature, geography, statistics. So, uh, you know, what can we do to help, you know, children reach their full potential, right? We've already kind of discussed this a little bit. We want to get a, kind of get rid of these labels, right? Um, and I think the school system is very heavy. I mean, you see that Rita, as a school nurse, right, Mom? Yes, yes. Very, I just hope that the world can open up into this and, and, and get away from um, the box, keeping children in a box, you know, right. that hopefully, and, and little by little, I think it is increasing. It is starting to, but it's not, not quite enough yet. No, I don't. Yeah, I agree. Um, there, there actually is, there actually is in the world, there's going to be people that, oh, the paranormal, no way. You know, they don't want anything to do with that. So there still is that stigma, I think, a little bit. And, and I think it's because there's no actual black and white to it. There's, there's not the actual proof necessarily, even though there's a lot of, uh, of things that the, the paranormal investigators do and they receive it. Like I've heard you mention, there's actually no absolute proof. But but you know what's going on. I mean, there's so much more awareness, but maybe not quite enough broadly, broadly uh, branched out. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? My cat, there we go. She chimes in every week. Oh, all right. I think she's hungry. Um, I'll feed her in a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is also true. I mean, I just think that we need to start thinking of our future generation and not just you know, for what they can do for the paranormal field. This is for all aspects of life. This is our future generation. I mean, learning to foster intuitive gifts and psychical gifts helps in so many different ways. It helps with career. It helps with self-concept. It helps with self-esteem. It helps with, uh, you know, a social and familial dynamic in so many different ways. So, you know, it's funny. Uh, not, I don't know why I said funny. That's the wrong word. I think it's fantastic. Uh, Todd Bates, who uh, runs the WLTKDB network. I mean, he's, oh my God, he's amazing. He's taught me so much about radio. It's fantastic. He, uh, his show, Haunted Voices, obviously that's been around since 2004. He had Kim Peek and his dad wow. on, wow. on Haunted Voices. Yes. Wow. He just said that. I was like, oh, my gosh. I, I got I got chills. He just Is told that, me that still archived so we could listen to it? Is there any possibility? I, I Yeah. I, I, see, Todd, is that archived? Let's see if you can. Oh, I would, see I would he, love to listen to that. That's something that, that would be fascinating. Yeah, I'm watching the chat. So I'll let you know if he. If, yeah, I bet it is because there's archives of. Oh, oh wait. No, he's, no. He said, yeah, no, you may be able to find it online. Okay, so we'll have to look for that. That's yeah, awesome. wow. we'll have to look for that. How special that would have been, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's amazing, Todd. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh. So, you know, helping these children reach full potential, society needs to start channeling their gifts instead of ostracizing them. We need to accommodate these newer generations, generations of children and the natural evolution of human species. The thought is that these children are here to spread peace, honesty, and integrity in the world 
and onto the planet. In turn, we will see cures for diseases, dissolution of animal extinction, increased humility in uh, world peace, etc. So that's kind of the thought process on that. Uh, wow, this this was all done in an hour, which is great. Uh, great show, Nicole. The value yeah. I feel like I feel like I kind of like. I mean, I you didn't talk too much. I'm sorry about that. If I could, talk, Nicole. <laughs> Sorry about that, Mom. <laughs> what you say is so valuable. Are you kidding? Oh, oh you're so sweet. But um, let's see. So, you know, I failed to mention this on my previous shows. I'm, I, I have to apologize for that. I need to start doing this. But please, please check the other shows out on the WLTKDB network. There are some amazing hosts and amazing shows out there. And I, I, again, I apologize for failing to mention that on previous shows. I need to make a point of doing that. So uh, anyways, yeah, this was a kind of a, a different format for tonight, but mom, I thank you so much for joining me and, and providing you your insight. Thank you. thank you for letting me be here. Nicole. Absolutely. Welcome anytime. So uh, next week we have Marie Jones, Marie D. Jones on. That's uh, Thursday, April 8th. And so it'll be exciting to talk with her. She's a, a wealth of knowledge. And, you know, I always enjoy talking with her. Her and I and, and Denise Agnew, by the way, are, are collaborating on a project. That's all I'll say right now, but we're collaborating on a project. More details to come soon. But uh, anyways, I hope you enjoyed uh, the show tonight, and I hope everyone has, I know it's Thursday, so the weekend's coming up, I hope everyone has a, a wonderful weekend, a wonderful night, and as always, I end the show by saying here at the Afterlife Chronicles, we are bridging the gap between mortality and the afterlife, one experience at a time. See you next week, folks, and have a great night.